again guys hope y'all are doing well today want to do a video today and talk about some ways that you can maximize your earning potential in the expediting business um, we all want to make more money obviously and we're going to talk about a couple ways to do that by getting qualifications so if you've never been in trucking or expediting before, um, you know, you've just had regular jobs, we all know the way you make more money in a regular nine to five job is by promotions. Well, in expediting, you don't have promotions. The way you can make more money is by getting as many qualifications and certifications that you can. So I'm gonna talk a little bit in detail about the certifications or qualifications um, that you should really, really consider getting um, before you get into this business or even if you're already in the business and haven't gotten these qualifications. And then Jason's gonna talk a little bit about some of the um, equipment options on trucks um, that can help you also maximize um, getting loads and things like that. So in expediting, we do a lot of sitting sometimes. Uh, month of January can be pretty slow. Uh, coming up today is Martin Luther King Day. So, you know, days like that, people are taking off from work. And that kind of slows down the shipping stuff a little bit. So in expediting, you really want to max to minimize the amount of time that you're having to sit um, before before we had our passports, you know, we uh, sat quite a bit. You know, we'd do a load, sit two days, wait for a load. Do another load, sit a day, wait for a load. So, you know, that wasn't really very fun, you know. <laughs> Sitting in an 8 by 8 box, you know, waiting for our next load all the time. 100 degrees out or even 0 degrees out. You know, it's not really not that fun to be sitting, so you want to minimize the amount of time that you have to sit, and by doing that, the way you do, that we've found that you can do that is by getting qualifications, you know, passport, hazmat, TSA, and we'll go into a little bit of depth on both of those. So one of the first things you want to think about getting um, before, either before you get into the business or even if you're already in it and haven't gotten this, is a passport. What the passport is going to allow you to do, it's going to allow you to take loads in and out of Canada. Now, not everybody wants to do that and not everybody wants to get a passport. You know, it does cost money to get a passport. You have to go to the, most of the time, you can do it at some post offices that have passport offices there. Um, you can also go to the main passport office um, in your major city. But um, it does take a, a few weeks to get that. So um, that is something, though, like I said, that, that's going to allow you open up those load opportunities uh, to where you can get more loads. There was a few times we were down in Laredo. There was like 10 other Panther trucks there. We were like number seven in line to get the next load. But since we had our passports and nobody else down there did, and they had a load going from Laredo into Canada, we got that load because nobody else had their passports. So, whereas we probably would have been sitting two, three days waiting for our next load because of all the, all the trucks that were down there, we were able to get uh, get out of there pretty quick because we had our passports. Now, I will say, uh, we hated going to Canada. Uh, the border checkpoints are rude. They're, they can search your truck if they want. And that's um, going in and out of Canada, both right? sides. Yeah, they're actually ruder coming back into <laughs> yeah. the U.S. Yeah. They're like, they treat you like you're uh, 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 Yeah, that you're not, not a U.S. American. citizen. Yeah, so... <laughs> But, it, you know, it, it helped us a lot of times, you know. It got us out of those bad areas. Now, it doesn't mean you always have to take the low going to Canada, you know. There was a few times we were sitting in Buffalo, New York, and they wanted us to take a, a load over to Toronto. I was like, I'm not going to do that. That don't, It's 
too much of a pain in the butt. It doesn't make enough money. And, you know, I would turn stuff like that down. But I would utilize it to help me get out of those bad areas like Laredo or if I'm in California or, you know, just any bad area, you know, it could help you get out of those areas where there's a lot of other trucks. Something else to keep in mind, if you do decide to get a passport and you're getting it for your job, that is a tax write-off. Y'all know how I like to mention things when they are a tax write-off. So even though it does cost money up front, it is something that um, you can write off on your taxes as a business expense because you're getting it for uh, business purposes. Now, keep in mind, if you're a team, both of you will have to have your passports to get into Canada. Not just one of you can have it. Both of you will need to have it. Um, another thing, if you have animals on the truck and you're going to go into Canada, you need to have their shot records with you. Um, now, we never were asked for those when we did cross the border and they knew we had the dogs with us, but that is something that they can ask for. And you don't want to be turned away from the at the border because you don't have your dog's shot record. So, you know, that's something you should keep with you anyway in case anything happened out on the road. You know, say your dog bit somebody. You want to have proof that your dog has its shots. So, um, something to keep in mind. Also, going into Canada with Panther, um, I can't speak for really any of the other uh, expediting companies, but I'm sure they probably have something like this as well. But with Panther, you do get a little extra money um, on those Canada loads uh, to get, basically they're paying you to go across the border. Um, it's probably basically kind of like paying you for your hassle to have to deal with the border uh, uh, patrol and things like that, entering, crossing the border into Canada. Um, usually you don't get paid coming back, back out of Canada. Um, if you're not loaded, I think if you're loaded, you may get something coming back out um, from Canada as well. A little bit extra pay on that. Um, also, if you go into Canada, they do require your vehicle to be governed at 65 miles an hour. You have to have a governor. Now, Panther, they will pay to uh, put that governor on and take it off. I know... When we were doing Canada, we were doing it in the old truck we were in before this one, and it had a governor on it, and we just it was just on there all the time. But you can have them put it on and take it off every time you go in and out of Canada, and I'm sure some people do that, um, but to us, it's kind of just a pain to kind of have to do that every time. So it was just left on the old truck that we used to drive. So that's something to think about. One of the first qualifications to get is the passport. The next qualification I want to talk about um, that you really need to consider getting is your hazmat uh, endorsement. Now, the hazmat endorsement is very easy to get. You basically um, you go into your DPS office, your driver's license office, and you take a test. To get that endorsement. If you pass that test, they're going to put an endorsement on your license so that you can do hazmat. Um, there are several things online that you can read um, to study about the hazmat, and I, we can link that down below. I believe there's a website you can go to to get um, the book on uh, uh, the hazmat training. There, there's also some websites that have practice tests. Practice tests, tests yeah. You know, you can take some practice tests and study up before you go take your tests, you know. Um, also, if nowadays, uh, if you do hazmat, some hazmat stuff requires a tanker endorsement. Now, that's a real easy endorsement to get. Um, I think it's only about a one page worth of reading in the CDL handbook. Yeah, uh, much. It just talks about baffles, uh, things that prevent the liquid from sloshing back and forth stuff like that but if you're going to be hauling hazmat every once in a while you'll get a load that is uh what's considered totes and i'll insert a picture of a tote if you don't know what what that is yeah, yeah it's about the size of a pallet um it's large takes uh basically holds a bunch of liquid so um it, it also if you're getting your hazmat get that tanker endorsement also because 
you don't want to lose a load because you didn't have that tanker endorsement and the customer didn't notify dispatch that it's in totes, not barrels. So, And on the tanker endorsement, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a hazmat material. You can get bulk liquids in totes at, for a load and it's not hazardous material. So having that tanker endorsement knowledge and endorsement, it's going to help you, um, you know, just knowing how the vehicle is going to handle with that bulk liquid sloshing around back in the box of the truck, uh, cargo van, um, you know, having the knowledge is, is key and, and knowing how to handle driving with that stuff. And like Jason said, the test for that is so, I think it was 20 questions and the little thing you have to read for it, I think, is maybe two to three pages. It is not very long at all. Um, and now, you know, that's one of those things that, you know, I think we've probably done totes maybe five times. Yeah, it, it, in three years, it hasn't been very often. But again, you want to have that um, ability to be able to do that. You know, if you're sitting somewhere and that's the only load they have and you don't have that tanker endorsement, there, you can't get that load. So, again, another good thing uh, to have. Um, talking about the hazmat and the uh, tanker endorsements, anytime you go in and get an endorsement on your CDL, of course it's going to cost you some money. It's probably, I think, for us in Texas, it's 10 bucks. I don't know if it's different in other states how much it they charge. Um, I would think it'd be about the same amount, but you would want to find out through the state wherever your CDL is and where you would go to take that test. But that again, another write-off on your taxes. Anything CDL related that you're doing, tests and endorsements, when you pay for those, you can write those off, even renewing your CDL. So remember that. That is a tax write-off. Make sure you keep those receipts so that you can write off those uh, endorsements you're paying for. So the next qualification certification we want to talk about is the TSA certification. What that is, that basically is a certification for you to be able to pick up and do deliveries to, to major airports. Any so to get your TSA certification, that's something you'll have to do after you're hired on with a company. Um, you'll have to talk to your, their safety and ask them if they even provide a TSA training. Um, for instance, Panther, they, uh, they do the training. They'll send over the training in an email. You'll read a bunch of stuff. They'll send you a 20 question test and you'll get your TSA certification. And that's another good thing to really help prevent from sitting, you know. Um, a lot of people don't want to deal with airports, so you know, it's going to help me make more money, whereas I would have just been sitting. Um, that's a qualification I don't mind having. Now, with the TSA certification, you don't have to pay for that um, through the company. That is something that is free to do. Um, so that's an option, like Jason said, to think about getting. Next thing I want to just touch on briefly, Panther has what's called life science loads. And that's another thing you have to get certified through uh, Panther to do. And what that is, it's a lot of times pharmaceutical loads, some reefer loads, things like that, that require special handling. Now, we've never done very many of those. I think we've done one or two, not refrigerated ones. But um, that's another qualification to think about getting to help uh, maximize you being able to get more loads. The last main qualification that we want to talk about is getting your government clearance um, so that you're able to call freight for the government or Department of Defense loads. Now, getting your government clearance, you know, Jason and I did that. It was a very long process. It doesn't cost you anything to do that. It is pretty intimidating at first because the application you have to fill out is about an inch and a half thick. Um, you know, they ask a lot, a lot of questions and um, actually if you flip through that application, it looks more intimidating
exciting than it is. Um, a lot of it is stuff that you really doesn't pertain that you may not have to fill out. Um, but again, you fill out an application and you have to do this through whatever carrier you're with. You can't just do it on your own. You have to be sponsored by a carrier. But you fill out this application and, and DOD loads, it does have to be a team. And you can't do them if you're a solo driver. So this, it's only going to apply for teams. But both of you have to fill out an application. Once you've done that, that gets sent off to uh, the government. And then they're going to look over everything. Um, sometimes they may want to do an interview with you. Um, and they'll let you know. They'll set up a time. A representative will meet with you to talk about things on your application. Um, and once they've done that, you know, and they make their decision, they'll let you know if you're, if you're approved to haul government freight. Now, it is sometimes a tedious process. Like I said, it took Jason and myself a whole year almost to get that whole process done and approved. Um, it took a few months for us to get the applications filled out. Once we did that, you know, you go in, you have to be fingerprinted. There's background checks. Um, then we had to set up times for each one of us to go in for interviews with the representative from the government. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, uh, some of the problem, I think, with us, we were, in, we were in the process of doing it. It was at the time when the, the government shutdown was going on, too. So I think that might have delayed the process for us. But it can take anywhere from six months to a year to get that um, clearance if, if that's what you're trying to do or want to get that. But if you can get that, that is a great qualification to have. And not only is it going to open up a whole bunch more oppor load opportunities for you. I mean, doing the government loads, there's been times where we've gone to places where we would have never taken loads to with general freight because we knew we wouldn't get out of there that now we can take loads there because we know nine times out of ten we can get a government load coming out of there and we're not going to end up sitting so the government clearance really opens up a whole a whole lot of, of load opportunities for you another thing to consider is getting your twit car and it's twic um that's basically, uh, they do a background check, they'll give you a card with your picture on it. Um, that allows you to go on to ports without escorts. Um, a lot of uh, military bases, some will accept a TWIC card as a form of identification. But um, the, the way the TWIC card really saves you is, if you have to get an escort on a port, uh, a lot of times they'll charge you for that escort. and. If you have a Twig card, you're not going to have to pay somebody to escort you uh, through that sec secure area. So uh, that's that's a really good thing to have also. Now, it does cost to get a Twig card. Um, I believe when we got ours, it was about $120 each that we had to pay. Um, that is a tax write-off as well. So, and also you may check with some companies or, or carriers like Panther, FedEx, uh, those carriers, they may reimburse you for that if you got your government clearance and that's the reason that you've got, you got it, even though it's not specifically just for government clearance. Um, but if they do reimburse you for it, still save your receipts because... If they reimburse you for it, they're counting that as income, right. and you're still going to write it off. The only difference is that you're going to get your money back up front uh, within a week or two instead of having to wait a year to write it off on your taxes, so right. keep that in mind. Right. So some of these qualifications I just want to talk about real quick, um, and I know Jason touched on this a little bit in one of his videos, but... A lot of the qualifications, like the government clearance, having your hazmat, um, you do get a little bit more on your rate per mile for those qualifications. So not only is it opening up more chances to get loads, but it's also getting you more money for per, those loads. Per mile. Per yeah. mile. So, you know, that's another great thing to think about um, doing. Also, most of these qualifications are going to require a background check so I know there's some people that you know may have issues and they're not able to pass a background check so that's something to think about too you know um, I'm not saying that if, if you don't have
have these qualifications, you can't be successful, you know, it, it's just going to be a little bit harder and you're going to have to do a lot more, more uh, positioning yourself in the right areas and staying in the prime service areas to get the general freight loads. So something to keep in mind um, when you're thinking about getting these qualifications. I read a lot of questions online of people asking, hey, should I get a lift axle, uh, which is an, a double axle in the rear, or should I get a lift gate? And, you know, it really, you know, you would think those would help you get more loads, but that's not always the case. For instance, with a lift gate, uh, a lift gate can hurt you on not getting loads because a lot of, a lot of shippers, especially in automotive, don't want a truck that has a lift gate uh, picking up or delivering to their location because they can't use those safety locks to lock the truck to the, the dock. Now some lift gates do have that feature on it, but I haven't seen a lot of them. It, it's, it's not something that comes on every lift gate. So if you're going to be doing a lot of automotive uh, freight and you're really relying on that, a lift gate is not going to be a really good option. To have on your truck or even to drive a truck with a lift gate. Um, I've talked to people who do have lift gates and they've said they've used them anywhere from two to five times in a whole year. So you know, you're really not going to miss out on too much freight by having a lift gate and you're almost going to lose out on more freight than you would gain by having one. Um, with the lift axle, Again, that's going to depend on a lot of the freight you, you're going to be hauling. Um, automotive freight can be pretty heavy sometimes. So, you know, if there's a load that's 11, 12,000 pounds and you have a lift axle, you're going to get that load before anybody else because no other truck can handle that. But, you know, we've never driven a truck with a lift axle. I don't know how many loads are out there like that. But for our truck, we drive a basic drive box, single axle, nothing special about it. We just have a lot of qualifications, and we do just fine with that, you know. Um, I think having the more qualifications will actually help get you more loads versus uh, more expensive equipment. So uh, that's really something, uh, you, you know, you can, you can do some research. You know, uh, ask people, if you know, talk to people that have double axle trucks and ask them how much more freight do they get where they have to haul that much weight. But in, in the kind of freight we do, you know, we, we do just fine with a single axle truck. Um, you know, we don't haul a lot of weight. Uh, the most, I think the last heaviest load we hauled was about 8,500 pounds. And gosh, that was a couple months ago, maybe four or five months ago that we did that rest of the loads uh, two three four thousand pounds so um, I, I don't think you if you get more qualifications it's going to help a lot more than having uh, more expensive equipment and one thing to consider too if you're buying your own truck you know a lift gate and a tag axle are things that you can add later to that truck that's not something that you have to buy the truck with um, of course, buying it later, you're not going to be financing it in with the truck, which sometimes is a better option anyway. You're not paying that extra payment on it. But it is something, you know, if you get out here and you, you want to own your own truck right away and not drive for an owner, you can start with that basic model of the truck without those extras and add those on later. Um, especially the, the tag axle, really it's better to add it on later anyway because there's a tax that they'll charge you, and Jason can talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, but. any truck, uh, for instance, our truck, we're uh, rated to care, uh, be, our gross vehicle weight can only be 33,000 pounds. Um, if you buy a truck that can haul more than that, that is rated to carry more than that, there's a, a federal excess tax that is charged, uh, kind of like a sales tax. But if you buy a 33,000 pound rated truck, you don't have to pay that tax, which is, you know, a lot of people do that. And then six months later, you can add the tag axle on if you, you find that it's going to help you get more loads or 
you're going to be hauling a lot of heavy stuff. So it's something you can add six months later and not have to pay that tax. Right. And so that's something to think about, you know, um, as well. So I hope this helped y'all um, to kind of give you some knowledge about the different qualifications that are out there that you can get, um, again, to help maximize getting loads and also some of those like qualifications, like I said, will help you get a little bit more rate per mile. Um, also hope that helped as far as if you're wondering, well, should I get a lift gate or a tag axle? Um, so if you have any questions about anything we talked about in this video or any of our other previous videos, let us know. As always, like I say, you can leave the, the comment in the comment section below. Email us. Send us a message on Facebook, Instagram, any of those ways you can get in contact with us. And we will see you in our next video. Thanks, guys.